Hi, I'm Victor Shoup, and I'm going to be talking about the security analysis of SPAC2+. And uh, as let me start with some background, going back to the olden days where we just had traditional password authentication protocols. We have a client with a secret password Pi, a server who stores um, some salt along with the hash value. And this is a hash of the password identifying information of the client and server and the salt. That's this, so these are the two values that the server stores, stores. And then when the client wants to log into the server, he simply set his password over to the server. The server would hash everything. He would hash the password, this identifying information along with the salt and test whether or not um, um, these two values, this hash value here matches the hash value that was computed here. So that's the way kind of things worked back in the 1970s or 80s. I think we used this uh, thing called Telnet way back then. And of course it was very insecure because if you logged in over the internet or over, then, then what would happen is that you'd be sending your password out in the clear. And of course, everybody could just see your password and steal it. So what that's been replaced by and what's actually quite widely used today is the following kind of scenario where we combine this basic password protocol with one-sided authenticated key exchange. So here the client and the server would run a, a one-sided authenticated key exchange protocol using just the server's public key. We assume that the clients don't have public keys. And then once this uh, a secure channel has been established in this way, then, well, the client knows he's talking securely to the server and the server also knows he's talking to somebody, but he doesn't really know who he's talking to yet. So then what? Then the client and the server would use the secure channel to run this simple protocol here. And that's, and then once that was done, then the server would know that he's talking to the client who knows the password. Um, so that's kind of the way a lot of things work now on the internet. Um, some limitations of this approach is that it requires a public key infrastructure, certificate authorities, etc., And it's also open to so-called phishing attacks, um, which most people I think knows, know, know what those are. Um, so one way to mitigate these uh, limitations uh, is to use something called password authenticated key exchange or PAKE for short. This is an idea that's been around for a long time. It was introduced by Bellevin and Merritt in 1992. It eliminates the need for a PKI, which is nice. Um, and it prevents uh, so-called offline dictionary attacks. So I'll have more to say about that in a minute, but the main ideas are as follows. So it, we have an adversary that um, if he actively interacts with the client or the server, uh, say the adversary might pretend to be the client and interact with the server or pretend to be the server and interact with the client, then of course, what the adversary can always do is just run the protocol with some particular guess at the password. And if the protocol succeeds, he'll know he's gotten the right password. And if it fails, well, he can try it again, right? So with every run of the protocol, um, the adversary effectively just gets one guess at the password. Um, if an adversary passively observes the client and the server talking to each other running this protocol, then um, the adversary should get no information about the password. And um, all of this should hold, even if the adversary learns um, some information derived from the session key uh, or the session key itself. So let, to, to illustrate like what are the issues involved here, let me just uh, go through a couple of simple examples by way of background. And this is more for people who really haven't looked at this problem very much before. Um, here's a simple protocol that's not a very good protocol. I'll call it SPAC0, simple PAC0. So client server have a shared password pi and they just exchange random nonces X and Y, and then they compute their session key as a hash of the password, um, their identities, and the two random nonces. And the idea is that, you know, this should, at least we're not sending the password in the clear here, um, but the problem with this is that an eavesdropper, even though he can't see the password directly from the protocol, he can still mount 
what's called an offline dictionary attack. And to understand how an offline dictionary attack works, suppose that um, the adversary watches uh, the, the parties exchange X and Y, so he knows those two values, and say that then after the session key K is established, um, one of the two parties sends out um, a message M along with uh, a, a MAC, uh, a message authentication code applied to that message using the secret key K and the adversary learns this MAC and say the adversary just knows this message as well. Uh, so the adversary knows all of these things. He knows M, he knows T, the, the, the value of the MAC. Um, and what the adversary can then do is try a whole bunch of passwords, pi prime coming from some dictionary of likely passwords and test whether or not when you plug in, well, when you plug in that password into the hash function and get uh, a test value for the session key and then plug that test value for the session key into the Mac algorithm, do you get the tag that you saw, right? So this is really bad if, you know, these, um, uh, Passwords, of course, can be somewhat weak and it might not be that difficult for the adversary to run through, you know, a few million or even a few billion uh, passwords to, uh, to figure out what the user's password is just by eavesdropping on a session like this. So this protocol isn't very good. Here's a protocol that um, tries to improve things a little bit. I'll call it protocol simple pick one. Um, this uses some elements of Diffie-Hellman key exchange. There's no public keys here. Uh, so each party generates an ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key. So the P here generates U as G to the alpha. Uh, Q generates V as G to the beta. They exchange group elements U and V. And then they uh, each compute the, the Diffie-Hellman key G to the alpha beta. So Q computes that as U to the beta and P computes uh, G to the alpha beta as V to the alpha. And then they dump all of this information into the hash function, U, V, and W, and, um, and that's their session key. What you can prove about a protocol like this is that under the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption and modeling the hash function as a random oracle, you can prove that an eavesdropper can't mount an offline dictionary attack of the type that we saw on the previous slide. However, <clears throat> an active adversary who plays the role of either P or Q can still mount an offline dictionary attack. So for example, the attacker can run the protocol as Q against an honest P. So he just runs, right, this protocol uh, knowing a beta and so he can compute W and he just makes a stab at the password pi just like before. And um, once the protocol gets to this step, right? And then if the attacker can, it, okay, for this attack to work, the following has to happen. Um, the attacker runs the protocol as Q and then he hopes that P is gonna send out uh, a, a tag like this, a, a, a MAC value like this. And then if P makes that first move, then the attacker can again, carry out an offline dictionary attack because he knows all the inputs to the hash function except the password. And so he can just do that kind of dictionary attack like in the first protocol. So this is better than the first protocol since uh, you the adversary has to actively engage one of the parties, but it only has to engage the party once. And then once it does that, it can do an offline dictionary attack. So here's a protocol uh, called SPAKE2 which is actually from uh, Abdallah and Poincheval in 2005. And it's a very simple and elegant protocol um, that does provide uh, security against an offline dictionary attack. So I've highlighted in blue here, the things that are different from uh, the protocol on the previous slide. So basically what this protocol does is, well, it makes use of two random group elements that are kind of uh, posted as public parameters for all to use. And it's assumed that nobody knows the discrete log of these two random group elements. Um, then the two parties, what they do is, well, party P here kind of masks the first group element with A to the pi and party Q here masks its group element by multiplying by B to the password pi and then when it comes to the next step, they both kind of unmask the, the values they receive from the other party here and here, and then they do the same thing. So this extra bit of masking and unmasking is the only difference between the two protocols. And what Abdallah and Poincheval proved was that 
uh, under the CDH assumption and modeling H as a random oracle, there are actually no offline dictionary attacks. Um, and again, there are still online dictionary attacks, but these can't be avoided, right? A party can still run the protocol once. Um, the adversary can still run the protocol once um, and make one guess at the password. So those can never really be avoided. So one limitation of this protocol is symmetry. Um, in a typical scenario uh, where you might use a protocol, protocol like this, the client memorizes the password pi and the server is gonna to have to store pi in a password file, right? And so if the password file is compromised, um, then um, all passwords for all users are immediately compromised, right? Um, so this is very bad. In fact, it's even kind of this, this kind of, um, uh, if, if this kind of password file compromise leads to even worse results, than in the traditional protocol where the server just stores a hash of the password plus some salt. Here, we've improved security in one sense by, um, by um, um, you know, not requiring a PKI um, and avoiding phishing attacks, but we've made security worse by making you know, a password file compromise lead to much more catastrophic results than in the traditional uh, uh, password protocol. So uh, to try to improve the situation, people have studied uh, this notion of asymmetric PAKE. And this has been around for a while. One of the early papers on this that has had a lot of influence is this paper by Gentry, McKenzie, and Ramzan from 2006. And it, it basically defines a notion of security whereby you do provide a protection against password file compromise. And more precisely, the notion of security introduced there says that essentially in order to impersonate a client to a server, the attacker must carry out an offline dictionary attack, even if the password file is compromised. So think about what happens when a password file on the server gets compromised. Now the attacker knows everything in the password file. So that adversary can now play the role of the server to an unsuspecting client that you can't prevent because now the attacker knows everything that the server knows. Um, but we should still hope that even after the adversary obtains the password file, that there's still some security left in the system. And, and that security says that the security property that we want is that now that the adversary has the password file, he still has to perform an offline dictionary attack uh, in order to um, break the system. So um, this, here's a protocol that uh, just embellishes uh, SPAC2 slightly. I call it SPAC2 plus. Um, this is in a paper that I published with uh, Cash and Kilt in 2008 and also appeared in my textbook with Dan Bonet in a preliminary version that's been available online for quite a while. And it's very similar to the, to the first, uh, to, to SPAC2. Um, the main difference is that now um, we take the password pi and we run it through a hash function f. And that generates two exponents, phi zero and phi one. The server is only gonna store phi zero. And instead of storing phi one, he just, he just stores the group element c, uh, which is g raised to the power of phi one. Okay, so this is what the server is gonna store. Um, he doesn't store the password and he doesn't store the output of this hash function. He stores this transformation of the output of the hash function. The client, of course, is going to know phi zero, phi one, because, well, if it's a human client, they'll know the password. They hash the password to get phi zero, phi one. Now, what happens is uh, in the protocol, the differences is, first of all, we're going to use phi zero here in place of the password in all the places we did before. Um, and in it, so that's one change. In addition, uh, where we're gonna use phi one is as follows. The client is gonna compute in addition to the group elements uh, UVW that it computed before, it's gonna compute an additional group element D, which is gonna be basically um, the same as W, but instead of computing W here, we could raise this group element to the power uh, 
uh, alpha, we, we raise this uh, same group element to the power phi one. The server is gonna compute the same group element by taking C, which is in its password file and raising that to the power beta. And you can check that if the both parties follow the protocol, then these two uh, group elements are the same. So this is the only difference. And intuitively, um, you know, while the server can compute this group element knowing C, right? Um, and beta, which the server chose itself, the client really has to know phi one to be able to log into the server. And the only way intuitively that the uh, client is gonna know phi one is if he actually inputs the password into this hash function to get both outputs phi zero and phi one. So this protocol is currently being standardized. And in both of these sources, it was claimed that this, you know, is a secure PAIC protocol and it provides resilience against password file compromise, but nothing was ever proved. One limitation of this protocol is that it's um, subject to what's called a pre-processing attack, right? So here the problem is this, for a given pair of users P and Q, an attacker could pre-compute all values of this hash function F on all uh, passwords pi prime coming from some dictionary. And then if it pre-computes all of that data, as soon as the attacker obtains the password file information here, you can do a quick table lookup to determine um, what is the right password, right? So even though the attacker still has to do an offline dictionary attack by computing you know, F for all these passwords, he can take that pre-processed information and immediately upon uh, obtaining the password file, get the user's password. So this, this is a limitation. It's, it's not as, as robust as we would like it. Um, more recently, a stronger notion of asymmetric peg security was introduced by, by Jarecki, Kravchek, and Zhu in 2018. Um, this also provides protection against pre-processing attacks. Um, but the difference is that in order to impersonate a client to the server, the attacker must carry out an offline dictionary attack, and that attack has to start only after the password file is compromised. So that's the distinction. But um, this is a limitation of SPEG2+, and um, we can't really say more about that. But what I do want to, um, but what I do want to do is focus on what we are able to prove on of this scheme. It's definitely not secure in the stronger sense, but it is secure in the or in the original sense of asymmetric PAKE uh, introduced by Gentry, McKenzie, and Ramzan. So what we the original goal of this work was to prove that under the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption and under the random oracle model for the hash functions, that this is a secure asymmetric PAKE. But to even prove a theorem like this we have to talk about security models. So there are two popular security models for, for PAIC. One is uh, what I'll call the BPR model, just named after the inventors, Bellari, Poincheval, and Rogaway from 2000. It's a game-based definition. It's actually very nice and fairly natural, but the problem is there's no natural extension of this to asymmetric PAIC. The definition was originally crafted for a symmetric PAIC, and there's no real nice extension of this definition to asymmetric PAKE. The definition that's an, another uh, model for security is the so-called universal composability model. This is simulation based um, and um, the UC model goes back a bit further, but it was applied originally to uh, the PAKE protocol, to, to PAKE protocols in 2005. Um, one nice thing about this uh, approach is that it extends to asymmetric PAKE um, this is what was done in the Gentry, McKenzie, and Ramzan paper. Um, but so this is the actually the, the model that we, we want to look at here. But unfortunately, SPEG2 is not even secure in the symmetric variant of, of the UC model. So um, that's bad news. And for the same reason, SPEG2 plus can't be secure in the asymmetric UC model. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the main results of this work are to define a new protocol, which I call KC SPEG2 plus. And this is basically just SPEG2 plus together with 
<clears throat> some straightforward key confirmation, just vanilla key confirmation, adding a, a couple extra flows to the protocol um, to do key confirmation. And then once we do that, once we add key confirmation, then indeed we can prove that this new protocol, uh, SPAC, SPAC2 plus with key confirmation is a secure asymmetric uh, PAC protocol in the UC model, assuming the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption and uh, in the random Oracle model. Along the way, we also proved that um, KC SPAC2, so this is just basically the original SPAC2 with key confirmation, we also proved that that's a secure symmetric PAC protocol in the UC model under the same assumptions. Um, we also look at a particular variant of, of KC SPAC2 plus that's currently being standardized and prove that's secure as an asymmetric PAC in the UC model. And we also uh, fix a few problems in the, in the current uh, formulations of security in both the symmetric and asymmetric uh, UC definitions of PAC. So quick review, 30 second review of the UC framework. You have the real world where you have a, uh, an environment interacting with various machines running the protocol. You have an adversary that interacts with these machines and with the environment. And when we're modeling a hash function as a random Oracle, uh, the random Oracle is kind of also down here um, and the adversary can, can interact with the random Oracle directly, although for technical reasons, the environment can't interact with the random Oracle directly. And in the ideal world, we just have a simulator, which is kind of just the, the, the ideal world's version of the adversary, interacting with some ideal functionality that kind of is a trusted third party that kind of does what the protocol is supposed to do. And then the, the protocol machines in the real world are kind of just replaced by dummy machines that are just repeaters that basically forward all the inputs to the to the trusted third party and, and, and forward outputs from the trusted third party back to the environment. And security just means that for all adversaries, there exists a simulator such that for every environment that there's no way for the environment to distinguish computationally speaking, uh, the real world, wh whether it's operating, the environment can't tell whether it's operating in the real world or in the ideal world. <clears throat> to, to, um, so we, we formulate security for um, a symmetric PIC, and I'm gonna skip over all of this because I don't have time. You can read the details in the paper. And I'm gonna to have to finish up. So what I do want to do is talk about in the last two minutes that I have available, um, why isn't SPAC2 UC secure? Because I think that's kind of like the most important thing. Um, so I think I can prove a theorem, although I haven't really done it, that protocol SPAC2 is not UC secure according to my definition or any others in the literature, but I haven't worked out the details of that. Whether or not it's a theorem is not so important. Well, more fundamentally, what's important is that any secure channels protocol that you might layer on top of SPAC2 is not gonna be UC secure either. By the way, in a concurrent work, uh, another paper uh, that came out uh, also made the same observation that SPAC2 is not UC secure. And they, in fact, show that SPAC2 is, is, is UC secure with respect to a weaker uh, ideal functionality that they call lazy extraction security. And I'll refer, refer you to their paper to see the details of that. But in a nutshell, what, what's wrong with SPAC2 uh, in the UC model without key confirmation? So suppose that we have uh, a server running with the, the right password pi, and we have an adversary who's just trying to make a guess, he's gonna run the protocol with a guess pi prime at the password uh, in the role of the client. So he sends to the server, he just runs the protocol uh, with this pi prime, uh, and he sends this group element to the server. The server responds, with, with this group element V computed in this way, just like in the ordinary protocol. Then suppose what happens next? Server computes the third group element W, dumps it all into a hash function to get the session key. And now say Q starts encrypting messages using this session key, okay? The problem is the simulator must immediately decide whether or not this key K 
is a fresh key or is a spoiled key, meaning fresh means that um, his guess at the password was incorrect and spoiled means it's his guess at the password was correct. Mean, and that means, and if his guess at the password is correct, that of course means that the adversary now knows the session key. So the question that the simulator has to answer at this point in time, without knowing anything more, is whether or not to treat this session key as a, as a secure session key or, or an insecure session key. Um, because the simulator has to start simulating the, the encrypted ciphertext above in some higher level protocol. Um, and at some later point in time, much, much later, the adversary might come along and, um, and uh, finish off the protocol, get his session key, and then and only then will the simulator now be able to see what the adversary's guess at the password was because he's gonna input it into this hash function. And now the simulator can test whether or not pi prime equals the, the adversary's guess at the password is equal to the right value of the password. So it seems like kind of a technical point, but it's actually uh, an important technical point, which tells us that to achieve any meaningful and useful notion of UC security for a PEG protocol, for a protocol like SPEG2, we, we have to add key confirmation flows to it. So I invite you to see the details of the, of the paper for more information about the details of the protocols the details of the security definitions, which I think are also interesting as they do uh, clean up some problems in previous work and then the proofs of security themselves, which I think are interesting. So that's it, I'm out of time. Thank you very much.